When it became clear that the police could no longer police themselves, the FBI had to get involved. The Mafia is by far one of the deadliest criminal groups in the world. From brokering illegal deals to executing people in the streets, you definitely do not want to double-cross them. However, when we see the police, we are expected to have a little respite, as they are meant to be heroes to save the day against the members of the underworld. However, what if they did not? What if they instead swapped their oath to the badge for easy and bloody cash from the hands of the Mafia? Terrible things, I tell you, terrible things. So in this video, I present to you five corrupt cops caught with Mafia members. Louis Apolito and Stephen Caracapa. Before they became notorious figures in the annals of crime, Louis Apolito and Stephen Caracapa were once promising young detectives, eager to make a name for themselves in the gritty streets of New York City. Their journey began in the 1970s, a time when the city was plagued by rampant crime and corruption. Apolito, born in 1948, was the son of a respected NYPD detective. Raised in a law enforcement family, he seemed destined to follow in his father's footsteps. Caracapa, on the other hand, grew up in the tough neighborhoods of Brooklyn, surrounded by the allure of organized organized crime. Despite their different upbringings, both men shared a common goal, to protect and serve the city they loved. Epolito joined the force in 1969, while Caracapa followed suit a few years later. Little did they know that their paths would cross, and their destinies would become intertwined in ways they could never have imagined. As young officers, Epolito and Caracapa quickly earned a reputation for their dedication and tenacity. They were known for their relentless pursuit of justice, often going above and beyond the call of duty to solve cases and bring criminals to justice. Their rise through the ranks was swift, as they proved themselves to be exceptional detectives. Apolito's sharp instincts and Caracapa's street smarts made them a formidable team, and they were soon assigned to high-profile cases that garnered attention both within and outside the police department. The duo's success did not go unnoticed, and they became local heroes, celebrated for their ability to crack even the most challenging cases. Their colleagues admired their work ethic and their unwavering commitment to justice. But beneath the surface, a darker side was taking shape. Unbeknownst to their fellow officers, Epolito and Caracapa had formed connections with the very criminals they were supposed to be apprehending. It was during this time that they caught the attention of a powerful mob underboss, who saw an opportunity to exploit their positions within the police force for his gain. Epolito and Caracapa found themselves caught in a web of corruption, torn between their duty as officers of the law and their allegiance to the mob. As their careers continued to flourish, so did their involvement with the criminal underworld. They began became trusted confidants of the mob underboss, providing him with valuable information and even carrying out hits on his behalf. The lines between right and wrong became increasingly blurred for Apolito and Caracapa as they straddled the worlds of law enforcement and organized crime. Their actions would have far-reaching consequences, not only for themselves, but for the entire criminal justice system. As Luis Apolito and Stephen Caracapa continued to operate under the radar, their double lives remained hidden from their colleagues and loved ones. But the truth has a way of surfacing and their carefully constructed facade was about to crumble. In the late 1980s, an investigation into organized crime began to gain momentum, led by a dedicated team of federal agents and prosecutors. Their target? The very mob that Apolito and Caracapa had been secretly working for. As the net tightened around the mobsters, the investigators stumbled upon a shocking revelation, the existence of corrupt police officers who were aiding and abetting the very criminals they were supposed to be arresting. The investigation soon zeroed in on Apolito and Caracapa, as whispers of their involvement with the mob began to circulate within law enforcement circles. The evidence against them was mounting, and it was only a matter of time before their secret lives would be exposed. In 1992, the truth finally came to light. Epolito and Caracapa were arrested and charged with a litany of crimes, including murder, kidnapping, and obstruction of justice. The news sent shockwaves through the city, as the public grappled with the realization that two trusted detectives had been living a life of crime. The trial that followed was nothing short of sensational. The prosecution presented a mountain of evidence, including witness testimonies, wiretap recordings, and financial records, all pointing to Epolito and Caracapa's involvement in the mob's criminal activities. The defense, however, fought tooth and nail to discredit the evidence, painting a picture of two dedicated officers who had been framed by the very criminals they had been investigating. But the jury saw through the smoke and mirrors, and in 1994, Epolito and Caracapa were found guilty on multiple charges. The fallout from their conviction was immense. 
the public's trust in law enforcement was shattered and questions were raised about the extent of corruption within the police force. The case also exposed the vulnerabilities of the criminal justice system, highlighting the need for stricter oversight and accountability. Apolido and Caracapa were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Their once promising careers had come to a disgraceful end, leaving a trail of devastation in their wake. But the story doesn't end there. The legacy of their crimes continues to reverberate as the repercussions of their actions are still felt to this day. The case of Louis Apolido and Stephen Caracapa serves as a chilling reminder of the dangers of unchecked power and the thin line between justice and corruption. Detective Hector Rosario it all began at the Grand Café, a seemingly innocent coffee bar in Lindbrook. Little did the unsuspecting patrons know that behind the scenes, the Bonanno and Genovese families were using this establishment as their headquarters for an elaborate gambling scheme. The operation had been running for at least a decade, starting in May 2012, and had managed to evade the authorities for years. But the Grand Café was just the tip of the iceberg. The crime families had their hands in various illegal gambling activities across the city. They ran underground poker games and operated gambling machines in soccer clubs located in Queens, Valley Stream, and West Babylon. To further conceal their illicit activities, they set up a front called Sal's Shoe Repair in Merrick, which served as a cover for their gambling operations. This collaboration between the Bonanno and Genovese families was unprecedented. These two organizations were known rivals, constantly vying for power and control in the criminal underworld. But in this case, they put their differences aside and worked together to maximize their profits and expand their reach. The partnership was not without its challenges. The two families had to navigate the delicate balance of power and trust. Each side had their own territories and operations, and they had to ensure that their interests were protected while working towards a common goal. It required careful coordination and communication to avoid any conflicts or misunderstandings that could potentially lead to violence. The success of their collaboration can be attributed to the mutual benefits it provided. By pooling their resources and expertise, the Bonanno and Genovese families were able to create a gambling empire that spanned across the city. They leveraged their connections, influence, and intimidation tactics to ensure the smooth operation of their illegal activities. The gambling operation was not just about making money, it was also a means of exerting control and influence over the community. The crime families used their ill-gotten gains to further their criminal enterprises, expand their networks, and maintain their grip on power. They exploited vulnerable individuals and communities, leaving a trail of destruction in their wake. Law enforcement agencies were aware of the activities of these crime families, but gathering enough evidence to bring them down proved to be a formidable challenge. The Bonanno and Genovese families operated with utmost secrecy, employing various tactics to evade detection. They were always one step ahead, making it difficult for the authorities to catch them in the act. However, the collaboration between the Bonanno and Genovese families would eventually come crashing down. The relentless efforts of federal authorities, determined to root out corruption and organized crime, led to a breakthrough in the case. The arrest of Detective Hector Rosario, a trusted member of the Nassau County Police Department, exposed the extent of the collaboration and sent shockwaves through the criminal underworld. The revelation of this collaboration between the Bonanno and Genovese crime families serves as a stark reminder of the enduring power of organized crime. It highlights the lengths to which these criminal organizations will go to protect their interests and expand their operations. The collaboration between rival families demonstrates the adaptability and resilience of the Mafia, even in the face of law enforcement efforts. Rosario's arrest came as a result of a relentless investigation by federal authorities determined to root out corruption and organized crime. The evidence against him was overwhelming, and the charges he faced were grave. The arrest of a corrupt cop was a blow to the integrity of the police department and a betrayal of the trust placed in law enforcement officers. The charges against Rosario included obstructing a grand jury investigation and lying to the FBI. These charges charges highlighted the extent of his involvement in the criminal activities of the Bonanno family. It was alleged that Rosario used his position as a detective to arrange police raids at competing gambling dens, effectively eliminating the competition and ensuring the dominance of the Bonanno family in the illegal gambling market. The revelation of Rosario's involvement in the scheme was both disturbing and shameful. He had betrayed his oath of office and the honest men and women of the Nassau County Police Department. The public's trust in law enforcement was shattered as they grew 
grappled with the realization that one of their own had aligned himself with criminals. The arrest of Rosario was a significant development in the case, as it exposed the inner workings of the collaboration between the Bonanno and Genovese crime families. It shed light on the extent to which corruption had infiltrated the police department and the lengths to which some individuals would go to profit from their illicit activities. Despite the overwhelming evidence against him, Rosario pleaded not guilty in Brooklyn Federal Court. He was released on a $500,000 bond, further fueling public outrage. Many questioned how someone accused of such serious crimes could be allowed to walk free while awaiting trial. The arrest of Rosario was a wake-up call for law enforcement agencies across the country. It served as a reminder of the constant battle against corruption and the need for rigorous internal oversight. The actions of one individual had tarnished the reputation of an entire department, and steps needed to be taken to restore public trust. The trial of Detective Hector Rosario would be closely watched by the public and law enforcement alike. It would serve as a test of the justice system's ability to hold corrupt individuals accountable and send a message that no one is above the law. The evidence against Rosario was strong, and the prosecution was determined to secure a conviction. As the trial approached, the public eagerly awaited the opportunity to see justice served. The revelations that would come to light during the proceedings had the potential to further expose the inner workings of the collaboration between the Bonanno and Genovese crime families. It was a pivotal moment in the fight against organized crime and corruption. The arrest of Detective Hector Rosario was a stark reminder of the challenges faced by law enforcement agencies in their battle against organized crime. It highlighted the need for constant vigilance and the importance of maintaining the public's trust. The trial would serve as a turning point in the case as the evidence against Rosario would be presented and the truth would be revealed. Rafael Perez it was the year 1995 when Perez joined the Crash Unit, a specialized anti-gang task force. His mission was to combat the rising tide of violence and crime that plagued the city, and he was determined to make a difference. Perez's undercover work was his bread and butter. He would go to great lengths to infiltrate the world of drug dealers, buying narcotics from them only to later arrest them and put them behind bars. It was a dangerous game, but one that Perez excelled at. He relished the rush of adrenaline that came with each successful operation, but Perez's dedication to his job didn't go unnoticed. His colleague, a seasoned officer, warned him about the dangers of becoming too immersed in the criminal underworld. Little did Perez know that his colleague's words would soon prove prophetic. Working primarily at night with minimal supervision, Perez had near absolute power and authority. He became untouchable, believing he was above the law. This newfound arrogance would lead him down a dark and treacherous path. It was in this very building that Perez's life would take a sinister turn. Alongside his partner, Nino Durden, Perez shot and framed an unarmed 19-year-old gang member named Javier Ovando. The consequences of their actions would be devastating. Ovando, once a young man with dreams and aspirations, was now confined to a wheelchair, his life forever altered by the corrupt actions of Perez and Durden. But the true extent of their betrayal would only come to light during Ovando's trial. Perez and Durden, driven by their own twisted agenda, lied under oath, claiming that Ovando had attempted to murder them in an abandoned apartment. But the truth was far more sinister. The building was not abandoned at all. Ovando lived there, on the same floor where Perez and Durden had set up an observation post. Despite Ovando's desperate pleas of innocence, his words fell on deaf ears. The jury, swayed by the perjury of Perez and Durden, sentenced him to 23 years in prison. It was a grave miscarriage of justice, one that would haunt the LAPD for years to come. As news of the case spread, rumors began to circulate about the LAPD's involvement with Death Row Records, a successful rap label owned by Marion Shug Knight, an alleged mob Peru Bloods gang member. The lines between law enforcement and organized crime were becoming increasingly blurred. Internal investigations revealed that Shug had hired off-duty police officers as security guards for death row, further deepening the web of corruption within the LAPD. But it was Perez's actions that would ultimately lead to his downfall. On March 27, 1998, Perez made a fateful decision. He stole six pounds of cocaine from an evidence room, catching the attention of detectives. The LAPD created an internal investigation task force focused on bringing Perez to justice. On August 25, 1998, the task force finally caught up with Perez. As he was being arrested, his first words were chilling. Is this about the bank robbery? The bank robbery in question had taken place just a year earlier. Three men had stolen a staggering $722,000 from a Bank of America branch in Los Angeles. One of the men, David Mack, was a fellow LAPD officer and a member of Crash. Perez had gone to Las Vegas with him, raising suspicions about his involvement. In December 1998, Perez 
has stood trial, facing charges of cocaine possession and intent to sell, grand theft and forgery. The jury deadlocked, leading to preparations for a retrial. But the investigation didn't stop there. Investigators delved deeper into Perez's activities and uncovered 11 more instances of suspicious cocaine transfers. It seemed that Perez's crimes were even more extensive than initially thought. Faced with the prospect of a lengthy conviction, Perez made a decision that would send shockwaves through the LAPD. On September 8, 1999, he cut a deal, pleading guilty to cocaine theft and providing crucial information about the illegal activities of his fellow crash officers. Perez's testimony would have far-reaching consequences. It implicated 70 crash officers in misconduct ranging from on-the-job drinking to murder. The city of Los Angeles was forced to vacate over 100 tainted convictions and pay out a staggering $125 million in settlements. The LAPD's reputation was in tatters. As the news broke, public trust in the LAPD plummeted. The community felt betrayed by those who were supposed to protect and serve. The tainted convictions caused by Perez's perjury had shattered lives and eroded faith in the justice system. Outraged citizens took to the streets, demanding justice and accountability. The LAPD was forced to confront the deep-rooted issues within its ranks and take decisive action. In response to the scandal, the LAPD created an internal investigation task force dedicated to uncovering the extent of the corruption within the crash unit. No stone would be left unturned in their pursuit of the truth. Task force investigators meticulously combed through evidence, piecing together the puzzle of Perez's crimes. They interviewed witnesses, analyzed documents, and connected the dots that would ultimately expose the full extent of the corruption. The investigation led to the indictment of 70 fellow crash officers. The charges ranged from on-the-job drinking and drug use to theft and even murder. The LAPD was facing a crisis of unprecedented proportions. As the trials of the indicted officers began, the city of Los Angeles held its breath. The courtroom became a stage for the shocking revelations of the crash unit's misconduct. Rafael Perez, once a trusted member of the crash unit, took the stand as a key witness. He provided crucial information about the illegal activities of his fellow officers, shedding light on the depths of their corruption. Perez's testimony had a domino effect, leading to the overturning of over 100 tainted convictions. Innocent individuals who had been wrongfully imprisoned were finally set free, their lives forever scarred by the injustice they had endured. The city of Los Angeles was forced to reckon with the consequences of the crash unit's actions. In an effort to right the wrongs, the city paid out a staggering $125 million in settlements, acknowledging the pain and suffering caused by the corrupt officers. The fallout from Perez's crimes was too great to ignore. The LAPD had no choice but to disband the crash unit entirely. It was a necessary step to rebuild trust and ensure that such corruption would never again tarnish the department. The disbandment of crash marked a turning point for the LAPD. It was a moment of reckoning, a chance to rebuild and redefine what it meant to serve and protect. The department implemented new policies and procedures to prevent a recurrence of such widespread corruption. The community, though scarred by the revelations, found hope in the reforms that followed. They demanded transparency, accountability, and a commitment to justice. The LAPD had a long road ahead, but the healing process had begun. Today, the legacy of Rafael Perez and the crash unit lives on as a cautionary tale. It serves as a reminder of the importance of integrity and the devastating consequences of unchecked power. Len Davis Len Davis, known as the Desire Terrorist, was a patrol officer who operated in the Desire public housing complex. But behind his uniform, Davis was involved in a web of drug activities that spanned the streets of New Orleans. He led a small cadre of law enforcers who pushed cocaine through the city, providing cover to drug dealers through violence, intimidation, and falsified evidence. Let's rewind to the 1990s, a time when corruption ran rampant within the New Orleans Police Department. Davis, with his menacing presence, struck fear into the hearts of both criminals, and innocent civilians. He was not just a cop gone rogue, he was the mastermind behind a criminal enterprise that operated under the guise of law enforcement. In 1994, the city of New Orleans was plagued by a wave of violence, with over 400 murders reported that year alone. Amidst the chaos, Len Davis used his position of power to further his own criminal agenda. He saw an opportunity to profit from the drug trade that was ravaging the city, and he seized it with both hands. Len Davis operated with impunity, using his knowledge of police procedures to evade detection. 
protection. He would tip off drug dealers about impending raids, allowing them to escape before the authorities arrived. Davis had created a system where the lines between law enforcement and criminal activity were blurred beyond recognition. But Davis's reign of terror didn't stop there. He used violence and intimidation to maintain control over his drug empire. Those who dared to cross him or threaten his operation were met with swift and brutal retaliation. Davis had no qualms about using his position as a police officer to silence anyone who stood in his way. A witness once saw Len Davis beat a young boy senselessly right in front of him. Len Davis's corruption knew no bounds. He would stop at nothing to protect his criminal enterprise, even if it meant resorting to falsifying evidence. Innocent people were framed for crimes they didn't commit, while the real culprits walked free under Davis's watchful eye. The extent of Davis's corruption became shockingly clear in 1994 when he ordered the execution of Kim Groves, a mother of three. Groves had witnessed Davis and his partner beating a young boy, and Davis saw her as a threat to his operation. In a chilling display of power, Davis had Groves silenced forever. The murder of Kim Groves would ultimately be the catalyst for Davis's downfall. The investigation into her death led to the unraveling of his criminal empire, exposing the depth of corruption within the New Orleans Police Department. In 1996, Len Davis was convicted of conspiracy in federal court. The trial shed light on the underpinnings of his crime ring, revealing the extent of his involvement in drug activities and the lengths he went to protect drug dealers. Davis was sentenced to death, and he remains incarcerated in the United States Penitentiary in Terre Haute, Indiana. The arrest and conviction of Len Davis should have marked the end of his reign of terror. However, the impact of his corruption continued to haunt the city of New Orleans. For almost three decades, the cases that Davis touched during his time on the force were left unreviewed, leaving innocent individuals imprisoned and the true perpetrators of crimes free to roam the streets. The review of the cases associated with Len Davis is just the beginning. The district attorney's office is currently re-evaluating hundreds of cases, seeking to rectify the injustices caused by his corruption. It is a long and arduous process, but one that is necessary to restore faith in the justice system. The arrest and conviction of Len Davis should have marked the end of his criminal enterprise, but the impact of his corruption continued to reverberate through the lives of those wrongfully convicted. For years, the cases that Davis touched were left unreviewed, leaving innocent individuals behind bars, while the true perpetrators remained at large. It wasn't until recently that the Orleans Parish prosecutors, along with a team of dedicated defense attorneys, began to systematically review the cases associated with Len Davis. The goal was to uncover the truth, to right the wrongs that had been done, and to bring justice to those who had been unjustly imprisoned. The review process was a daunting task, as it involved going through hundreds of cases that had been tainted by Davis's corruption. Each case had to be meticulously examined, evidence re-evaluated, and witnesses re-interviewed. It was a race against time to uncover the truth and bring justice to those who had suffered for far too long. As the review process unfolded, shocking revelations began to emerge. It became clear that the convictions of Burnell Juluk, Kunta Gable, Leroy Nelson, and many others were based on flawed evidence, coerced testimonies, and the manipulation of facts by Len Davis and his associates. Burnell Juluk, Kunta Gable, and Leroy Nelson, known as the Davis Three, were among those who had been wrongfully convicted for the murder of Rondell Sandinac. Their convictions were solely based on the testimony of Len Davis, who had falsely implicated them in the crime. The truth was that they were innocent victims caught in the web of Davis's corruption. The fight for justice didn't end with the review of the cases. It was just the beginning. The wrongful convictions exposed the deep-rooted flaws within the justice system and the urgent need for reform. The Orleans Parish prosecutors, along with advocacy groups and community activists, rallied together to push for changes that would prevent such injustices from happening again. Julian Piscina Finally, we go into the intriguing background of Julian Piscina's double life and his involvement with the notorious Texas Mexican Mafia. Julian Piscina, a Balcones Heights police officer, was living a life of deception. On the surface, he appeared to be a dedicated law enforcement officer, sworn to protect and serve the community. But behind closed doors, Piscina was entangled in a web of crime and corruption, operating as a member of the Texas Mexican Mafia. Piscina's journey into the dark world of the Mexican Mafia began years before his tragic demise. According to federal court records, Piscina claimed to be a member of the gang, but had not reported to them in six years. However, a hefty fine of $6,000 loomed over him, a reminder of his past involvement and the debts he owed. To repay his debt and maintain his standing within the gang, Piscina started reporting to gang leadership, specifically Jerry Idrogo and Ruben Reyes. He also resumed selling drugs to fellow gang members, further entangling himself in a life of crime. These secret meetings and drug deals became a regular part of Piscina's double life.
life. It was during one of these drug deals that Piscina's secret identity as a police officer was exposed. The shock and betrayal felt by the gang members were immense. Piscina had infiltrated their ranks, posing as one of their own while simultaneously upholding the law. This revelation sent shockwaves through the Texas Mexican Mafia, leading to an investigation into Piscina's day job. As Piscina continued to walk the thin line between his police duties and his criminal activities, his fellow officers began to grow suspicious. Officer Kenneth Ortiz, concerned about Piscina's ties to the Mexican Mafia, brought his concerns to then Balcones Heights Police Chief Henry Dominguez. However, these concerns were dismissed, leaving Piscina's double life to flourish in the shadows. Unbeknownst to Piscina, the FBI had been closely monitoring his activities. Secret surveillance cameras were set up, capturing his every move. The week leading up to Piscina's murder, the FBI was preparing to make their move, planning to arrest him and expose his corrupt dealings to the world. The stage was set for a dramatic confrontation between law enforcement and the criminal underworld. Julian Piscina's double life had reached a boiling point, and the consequences would be deadly. It was a fateful night on May 4, 2014, when Julian Piscina found himself outside the notorious ink tattoo and piercing shop in Balconies Heights. He was there to meet with Jerry Spooks Adrogo, a fellow member of the Texas Mexican Mafia. What was supposed to be a routine payment of his weekly tax quickly turned into a horrifying execution. As Piscina stood outside the tattoo shop, two men armed with a shotgun and a pistol arrived in a white car. Without warning, they opened fire on Piscina, their bullets tearing through his body. The sound of gunshots echoed through the night, shattering the illusion of safety in this seemingly ordinary neighborhood. The murder of Julian Piscina sent shockwaves through the the community and law enforcement agencies alike. The brazenness of the attack, coupled with the revelation of Piscina's double life, left everyone searching for answers. But little did they know, the truth was about to unravel. As the investigation unfolded, law enforcement agencies worked tirelessly to bring those responsible for Piscina's murder to justice. Their efforts led them to Toledo, Ohio, where they apprehended Jerry Spooks Idrogo, the driver of the white car on that fateful night. Idrogo, faced with the weight of his crimes, made a decision that would change the course of the investigation. In exchange for leniency, Idrogo agreed to testify against Alfredo Freddy Lo Cardona and Jesse J. Santibanez, two individuals who played a pivotal role in the murder of Julian Piscina. The courtroom became a stage for the shocking, revelations that would expose the depths of their involvement in the Texas Mexican Mafia. As Idrogo took the stand, he not only confessed to his role in Piscina's murder, but also revealed another chilling truth. He admitted to the murder of Billy Padilla, another Texas Mexican Mafia member who had failed to turn over drug money. The courtroom was filled with gasps of disbelief as the full extent of the gang's violence was laid bare. Ruben Menes Reyes, a high-ranking member of the Texas Mexican Mafia, also faced justice for his crimes. Reyes, responsible for ordering the hit on Piscina, had a long history of violence within the gang. In court, it was revealed that he had been involved in the murders of Ulysses Farias, Mark Lefty Bernal, Carlos Worm Chapa, and Johnny Smiley Solis. The weight of his actions finally caught up with him as he was sentenced to five consecutive life sentences. Both Alfredo Freddy Lo Cardona and Jesse J. Santibanez were found guilty of murder in aid of racketeering and discharging a firearm during a murder in aid of racketeering. The courtroom was shown the chilling footage of the ambush outside Piscina's tattoo shop, leaving no doubt about their involvement. They were sentenced to life in federal prison, ensuring that they would pay for their crimes. The arrests and convictions brought a sense of closure to the case of Julian Piscina's murder. But the shocking truth of his double life and the depths of corruption within the Texas Mexican Mafia left a lasting impact on the community.